Today is January 12th, 2023. We're almost two weeks into this new year, and it's safe to say that 2022 now seems like in a distant past. Just like any other year, 2022 was full of ups and downs, good and bad, successes and failures, but I wouldn't be the only one to say that last year wasn't like any other, and most of us were so ready to move on. At the beginning of the new year, most of us are excited to set new resolutions, leave all the bad things behind, and start from a clean slate. Despite our tendency to cling to familiar patterns and old habits, somehow New Year gives us hope that everything about our lives will automatically be different and better. But in the world of finance and business, things are not as simple as a set of New Year's resolutions, and there are a lot of uncertainties. Every year for economists, investors, and business owners, the question remains the same. What is the economic outlook going to be, and what should we do to prepare for it? In today's video, we will talk about the economic outlook for 2023 and how big companies are positioning themselves for the coming year. Before we begin, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and share your opinion in the comments below. We kicked off this year so far somewhat on a positive note. Last week, the job report for the month of December came in better than expected. Non-farm payrolls increased by 223,000 jobs versus expected 200,000, pushing the unemployment rate from 3.7% back to 3.5. Wage growth came in below expectations with average hourly earnings up 4.6% from a year ago versus the 5% estimate, clearly indicating that inflation pressures are easing. But wait, there was more. Not only did the average hourly earnings drop, but so did average hours worked, which has a major impact on the average wages and perhaps one of the reasons we are seeing wages drop in the first place. Now, here's the tricky part about the job report, and you decide whether it's as strong as the mainstream media was reporting it. The US Bureau of Labor Statistics releases regular job reports drawn from combination of two surveys, the Household Survey and the Establishment Survey. Both surveys gather important information, but they differ in their focus, sample size, and source population. The Household Survey includes data on demographics, labor force participation, employment, and unemployment collected from a sample of 60,000 households. This survey is used to measure the civilian labor force, including both employed and unemployed individuals. On the other hand, the Establishment Survey collects data from monthly surveys of 140,000 businesses and government agencies, representing over 400,000 individual work sites. This survey measures non-farm payroll employment by providing information about working hours and earnings for the United States workers. Unlike the household survey, in the establishment survey, individuals may be double counted if they have multiple jobs, and this is where the issue lies with the latest job report. An influx of part-time workers and multiple job holders led the current spike in employment. This does not sound good as the headlines. Let's take a look at the facts, and we will refer to this article by Zero Hedge that breaks it down really well. In December, the number of full-time workers was 132,299,000, down exactly 1,000 workers from the month before. At the same time, the number of part-time workers workers exploded by 679,000 from 26,115,000 to 26,794,000. Finally, the number of multiple job holders or those workers who need to hold more than one job to make the ends meet yet who are double counted by the establishment survey surged by 370,000, which means that the 223,000 payrolls numbers is really negative if adjusted for how many people actually got new jobs. In fact, in the last 10 months, multiple job holders have increased by a massive 684,000. This means that the 684,000 jobs that were added in the past 10 months were not the equivalent of 684 workers finding a job, but 684,000 workers finding more than one job to afford a living during soaring inflation. Again, the the entire employment increase was thanks to part-time workers, and to be totally frank, part-time jobs pay less, don't offer any benefits, and typically are far worse in quality than full-time jobs. That being said, can we call the latest job report strong? One could argue the opposite, but it was sure enough to give hope to the Fed that a soft lending is possible amidst this battle with raging inflation. Meanwhile, the way the big companies are positioning themselves suggests very little chance of soft lending and more like a potential recession. Look at this list of companies that recently have announced massive layoffs. You almost want to ask, what are these companies preparing for? Meta recently announced that it would cut 13% of its workforce, about 11,000 jobs, because of its declining revenue and negative global economic forecast. The company's stock has been bleeding down 60%. At one point in 2021, the company was valued at $1 trillion. Today, its value sits at $348 billion, $700 billion in the ground. Amazon, America's second largest employer, isn't holding back either. The company said it's planning to cut 18,000 jobs starting January 18th. The company's stock is down 
by more than 40% from a year ago. In 2021, Amazon was valued at $1.9 trillion. Today, it's no longer a trillion dollar company and its market value today hovers around $968 billion. Goldman Sachs, a Wall Street giant, also plans to cut up to 3,200 jobs, about 6% of their workforce. The company's revenue fell by 21% during the first nine months of 2022 compared with the same period a year earlier and its stock price has dropped by 10% over the past year. A few days ago, another bank came out with a bombshell report and it's more than just layoffs. Wells Fargo, once the number one mortgage lender, announced that the company is stepping back from mortgages and will now only focus on home loans for existing bank and wealth management customers and borrowers in minority communities. The move was primarily driven by continuous trouble with regulators. Last month, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau ordered Wells Fargo to pay a record fine of $1.7 billion for widespread mismanagement over multiple years that harmed 16 million customer accounts. Wells Fargo's decision to downsize its mortgage business was also driven by higher mortgage rates that have been stalling the housing market. In addition, the company is also pulling the plug on its correspondent business that buys loans made by third-party lenders. This shift will inevitably lead to new round of layoffs, but the company declined to name the number of how many jobs will be lost. Wells Fargo's announcement sent shockwaves through the mortgage and housing industry, leaving many wondering if this signals a challenging year ahead. We can clearly see that most big companies are positioning themselves for a contraction in the economy. While the 2023 economic outlook appears less optimistic, not all of it is bad. As we are recording this video, a new CPI report that just came a few hours ago shows that inflation has been on a downward trend for six straight months. Inflation is now down to 6.5% from 7.1% in November and well below the 9.1% peak in June. This is a good news. Although progress has been made, there's still a long road ahead before the Fed can reach its target of 2% inflation. The Fed is also likely to continue high rates, maybe not as aggressively. The battle is not over and the rates will remain elevated through 2023, causing businesses to operate leaner, hence all the layoffs we've seen from big companies lately. That's all I got today. I'd love to hear your take on the economic outlook for 2023. Please share your thoughts in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Till next time.